the question is, uh, are these red teams uh, capable of, of, of delivering physical pen tests? Craig, what, what do you think about that? Do you think people are adequately uh, capable and, and qualified to deliver these physical pen tests? Well, certainly there are some uh, very talented pen testers out there that have uh, great physical security skills. But I, I, I guess um, in some respect, I, I, I'd like to see a little bit more cross-training um, and a little bit more collaboration in uh, you know, some of the red teaming. Um, I, I think that uh, certainly a recognition of um, you know, the specialist skills that every uh, diverse member of a team can bring uh, it's certainly the case that, uh, I, to give an example from uh, the work that I do, um, I will secure everything and anything in terms of physical security up to the server. But once you're inside that rack, um, I'm quite prepared to step back and acknowledge that uh, others have you know, far more suitable skills and expertise than I do. And uh, I think that one of the things that gets ignored sometimes in terms of uh, physical security testing is the, um, uh, the, the civil... Uh, legal uh, implications. Now, certainly in some areas um, of Australia, in some jurisdictions, uh, security licensing dictates that uh, anyone doing physical security advising or consulting uh, holds a security licence and a master licence within that jurisdiction, which uh, may not necessarily be, um, I guess, well known or um, you know, well appreciated by some uh, you know, pen testers with an InfoSec background. Well, that's surely the majority of InfoSec people don't have these qualifications. I mean, the, the, when we look at red, test, red teaming as a, as a service, I don't think that, that, that InfoSec is, is at all have any, any, any of these qualifications. Like, is, is, that, is that a problem? I mean, is it, is it a problem with InfoSec? Is it a problem with the, the, the certifications or the qualifications? Look, uh, I think I've made it, you know, kind of quite well known that, uh, you know, holistic security and, um, and a, a balanced approach is, uh, is very much my view within security. And um, to have a look at uh, you know, the need for specialist skills in a variety of areas is, is certainly well defined. Um, as I said, I'd like to see InfoSec learning a lot more about um, physical security and maybe even you know, some form of um, professional or uh, you know, recognition or certification as they do for uh, InfoSec security. And likewise, I'd, I'd like to see a lot of physical security specialists that particularly in the areas of electronic security uh, that really should be exploring, uh, you know, what's required in terms of uh, information security these days, given the convergence between uh, electronic and uh, physical devices. What do you think about this? I mean, when you teach uh, locksmith students, do you, do you do the crossover into the red teaming world or do you teach them primarily for uh, client facing or, or, or other purposes? With um, training for the apprentices, we predominantly just focus on whatever the tasks are that the, the employers seek is relevant to them. Um, it's built into a set of training documents that we have to abide by, and um, it's very much based on purely what they can sell in the marketplace. Um, with our students, I do try to cover some of the holistic approaches. That we do cover some of the PSPF documents, um, but it's not inbuilt into the training. Um, unfortunately. Hopefully one day it will be. Do you see that there's a market for, for red teamers coming from locksmithing apprenticeships? It would be a great marketing tool for us to be able to say there was. <laughs> <laughs> hang, out of your, uh, hang out of a helicopter, you know, by your ankles picking open locks. Yeah, why not? Grace, do you have, do you have any comments about this? Is there, is there some sort of history background where we've seen um, sort of a, you know, a, a, the general public, you know, crossing over into physical security and sort of getting over into that sort of the professional market, not necessarily with qualifications, but, but being in, in the right marketplace at the right time? Um, that's a, I guess, that's quite a big question, but I was kind of more thinking, like, if you think about what the purpose of the red team is, so... You have a company that's like contracted with this team to test out their security. So, and what uh, they're getting at the end of that is like a report that says the things that they can improve on, right? So I suppose uh, if you, I think like a bunch of hackers could probably like get past, get past the physical security side, but I would, if, without more training, I would say I doubt their ability to give like, uh, you know, 
recommendations on how they could specifically like improve their physical security, if that makes sense. Like they might be able to like kind of bypass it, but uh, maybe not be able to give more like solid recommendations. So it's like a little bit different for <laughs> the question that you're asking, but kind of like I feel relevant to that. Well, well what do you think, Kleppis? Um, do you think that, that people in lock sport uh, are, are capable of, of performing red team assessments? What's your view of, 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 the, of the general uh, lock sport community in terms of delivering these services? So, so I, of the people in lock sport who I look up to and who I learnt from uh, and who publicly share information, which is how I, how I learned, um, I would say that many of them have either had a background, at least in some capacity, in doing either locksmithing or mechanical engineering or um, perhaps a background in, in the military. At least that's what I've seen overseas. Um, I think that it's quite possible for people who to self well, practice, right, in some senses, to figure out how to pick locks and then develop that into a skill where you can provide advice about physical security mechanisms. But because there's also door locking systems and all this other stuff involved, there's quite a lot to know to do it at least holistically or partly holistically. Can you teach someone on the digital side on how to at least a tiny bit about physical security? Any day of the week. Um, can the physical security world learn about digital stuff? Just as much. Um, as for the current status, I'm not quite sure because I don't, I don't do red teaming, so I can't really speak on that industry. Well, to, to sort of to, to go sideways for a little bit, what about the ethics of, of, of red teaming? I mean, uh, is there any vetting or, or, or background checks of, of the people involved in, in, in performing these, these, these pen tests or, or red team exercises? There, there's obviously ethical concerns. I mean, you know, you're, you're looking at you know, people's property and premises and, and, and whatnot. Um, Aaron, what, 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 sort of, what is the process in terms of, 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 of the, the personal checks on, on people entering a locksmith apprenticeship? Um, really depends on which part of the market you're working in. Um, Sorry about the arms, by the way. Just thinking on my feet. Really, the vetting is done by the employer. Some employers are very, very lax in the... He seemed like a nice enough guy, kind of. He can just rock in and maybe break into people's houses. That's fine. Compared to other places where they will make you jump through a number of hoops, you know, public record checks and... Fingerprint checks and all of the other available things I have, you know, national police checks and things like that. But on the whole, does the industry really do any good vetting? No. <laughs> Remember, guys, this is an interactive panel, so if you've got questions, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll ask our panellists. Do we have any... Uh, anyone want to... Wait up, over here. So everyone knows I'm from the Australian Lock Sport Guild. I want to get your guys' opinion on how you see the hobbyist and industry communities coming together as one to try and bridge this gap between the old guard and the new guard who think that what we do as a hobby should be kept secret by those in the industry. I think Joss could jump with this, maybe. Uh, I think Joss would be Joss, Joss uh, expert here. Yeah, it depends. Um, <laughs> It, baby steps is probably the the, the, the optimum word. It's just um, there, there are um, the older generation of locksmiths uh, are a lot about the secret information that should not be shared, and yeah, I, I do get what, where, where they where they're going with that because I mean most of what they learned was through apprenticeship. Uh, internet didn't exist in, in those days, so it was basically the dark arts that you were taught by other people. And uh, if you spent the better part of a lifetime getting that, that, that skill perfected, and then some other guy just goes on YouTube and figures out how to, uh, how to get these secrets out, yeah, I, I can see that pisses people off. Uh, but then again, that's the new world. So, so guide, the other side to this new way the world works, I think that's, that's, that's the way to go. So not try to piss them off too much, it's helpful. And uh, show them the other side. I mean, 
Um, I'm not from the uh, uh, locksmith side. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, uh, I'm a hacker that, that starts to figure out how hardware works. And that gives you a different skill set. We have a different way of looking at, uh, at, at security mechanisms. And that's, uh, as with the, the questions before about the red teaming and, and the IT, and uh, I think it's, it's different. Because if you're a locksmith, you will learn to operate that machine or that piece of metal in a way that is meant. And uh, an, an, uh, a pen tester does that with other metal bits, let's put it like that. But a hacker mindset automatically looks holistically. I mean, a hacker is 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 geared to look at fail. So, the, so you you're, you're looking at, at 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 errors in implementations or errors in whatever, and you use them to your advantage. So, I don't really care if if a red teamer has a lock lock locksmith background or ex-military, as long as he has a open mind and a a hacker mindset then all the skills that you actually need to get in can be obtained. And either by hiring a new guy in your team or whatever. But to look at, 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 at not just your core knowledge, but about a bit broader than that, that that's helpful. And the same goes for the older generation locksmiths who go like, oh, these new guys, they look at stuff differently. Maybe there will be helpful to have their input. I absolutely that, agree with that. but. As a client, as a customer, how can you? How do you know the the, the good hackers, like that that are capable of what they do, that are experts in their field, uh, word, word versus the snake oil? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. At, at least that's the way it works in in my neck of the woods. Yeah, which is not fair, but that's the way it is. Um, I have something. Oh. Oopsies. Uh, I have something to add to that. So I think um, what you're going to get is you're going to get some people, you know, people who have been doing this for their whole lives and the way that they've known how to do it, like locksmiths. And so they might take it. It's like part of their identity. So sometimes it can be really challenging for them to be confronted with this other way of doing things. So it can be really difficult for some people to, you know, be excited about these alternative ways of, like, attacking locks or uh, even thinking differently about how they could protect their locks. So I think that that would be something that uh, you have to kind of be mindful of when you're talking with people who have perhaps, you know, done it like the old way. But uh, kind of like adding in this historical perspective, right, like, and I kind of mentioned this in my talk, which was, um, you know, being very secret about locks was like, you know, really important. And it wasn't until, um, you know, you had the end of like the era of perfect security where these um, locksmiths started sharing and publishing um, information about these lock mechanisms um, and sharing that information did improve um, improve locks and you had people started to say like actually learning how to pick locks is really really valuable for learning how to um, protect against that but that information was still shared within like specific societies and it wasn't until the internet came along where you know anyone can access it that hobbyists came about so Hobbyists, like, it's like, in a way, you know, that's when it became kind of like you're saying with, like, you could just watch YouTube and learn a whole bunch about it. So it's still, like, really new for some people, the fact that there are these hobbyists out there that are picking these locks and kind of, like, challenging their worldviews and stuff like that. So you're definitely going to get people who are, like, resistant to it. But I think if you can kind of be empathetic in that way and kind of, like, trying to share... Uh, you know, being mindful of how you share this information or how you kind of approach these people, then I think maybe you will find unity a little bit, like, smoother, yeah. And, and it's a different skill set, because as a, as a professional locksmith, if you want to learn a new skill, of course you're going you're gonna to think about how can I market this? Because, mm. I mean, you put in an, an X amount of hours and you want to get paid in the end. And as a hobbyist, you just breaking shit because it's fun. <laughs> and and I, I don't... Yeah, that, I don't that's know. true. Yes, you get to break shit because it's fun. We have to put it back together. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to get paid. And it's, it's something totally else. Yeah, and, and if I break it, I might, if I feel inclined to, no, maybe write... No, you put it in the fuck it bucket. Yeah. And, and maybe Everyone has a fuck a, it a, bucket, a, a don't worry. white paper upon it, and you have to write a report. And that's... Uh, <laughs> that, that's yeah. I mean, I, I can spend months on an interesting subject because I think it's interesting. Yeah. And a locksmith would go like, no, 
because that's that, then his hourly rate would be sky high. Otherwise, it's 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 a bad business decision to do that. I think bridging the gap. Um, coming back to what Donna was saying, I think events like this are definitely going to help change some of the cultural mindset. I don't think everything's going to change. Um, I represent a very much of an old school perspective on things. Um, I'm glad to be here. I think it's important that we are here. We're glad to have you as well. <laughs> yeah, well, you haven't heard me talk yet. <laughs> um, I we not to agree. Yeah, we don't agree to one. Um, it's really, really good. These kind of events are going to help. Going into a locksmith shop and ball busting the guy behind the counter isn't really the best way to approach it. Um, just be nice. Tell them what you're interested in. Share their interests and you'll be surprised. Um, yeah, I know Mick is somewhere out there. Um, you know, by having that common interest in locks and breaking shit because it's fun, you know, if you told a locksmith, hey, I've got a bucket of thermite out the back, can we blow up your safe? Yeah, we'd do that because that's good fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, No, we don't call it hacking. We just call it a few beers and blowing shit up in the back. Um, So, look, we're not complete utter psychopaths. We did learn the hard way, and it it can be painful sometimes watching Bosnian Bill pick something in, like, three minutes and then a customer coming into the shop the next day and saying, my locks are all shit. Why did you sell them to me? You're the worst person in the world. Hey, man, I'm just trying to help you out. you, what you don't see is Bosnian Bill spending 36 hours picking that lock mm. so that he can do it in three minutes. And is it an, an appropriate attack, vec- attack vector? Um, this is good because this is education for you red teamers, black hats, white hats, grey hats, no hats, bald hair, <laughs> no hair, um, innocence, all of those beautiful, wonderful people. It's, it's all about education. And I, I'm... Tr- <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Follically... Follically deprived. Um, Challenged, thank you. (laughs) It's really good. I would love to have a customer come into my shop and have a 10-minute conversation to me about the perfect lock or the best lock and have an understanding that it all fits together in one beautiful mosaic that we call security. Unfortunately, in Australia, it's not quite like that. I think just to add something that uh, Aaron's been talking about and and something that both Aaron and Joss have both touched on is commerciality. Um, I think this is where, you know, the Locksport community, if if they want to bridge that gap, um, certainly there's got to be some work on the part of the locksmiths for embracing, uh, you know, new thinking and and new ways. But then there also has to be, I guess, an element of um, respect or mutual respect coming from the Locksport community with regards to commerciality. Um, there are instances where we have lock sporters going out and, and starting lockout services. Um, and you know, you've got to understand that when you start talking about people's livelihoods, um, you know, it, it, it starts cutting deep and, and, and you know, it gets emotional and, and people get hurt feelings and, and you know, things get said. And, and, I'll just, uh, I'll just swat your house. That's what I'll do. Yeah. And if I find that you're doing that, I'll just swat your house. Yeah. And, and look, to be honest with you, um, I'll be blunt with you, as a locksmith having operated my own business in the past, the amount of red tape that we have to go through in terms of licensing and the expense to see someone come in and undercut you without having any of those restrictions and just because of, uh, you know, the fact that the you know, the regulatory authorities don't seem it as a, a cost-benefit to actually prosecute the matter, uh, you know, it's taking food out of the mouths of, of your family. And the other thing is, is that, you know, it... it it undoes all the good work that the Locksport community does in terms of promoting their ethical framework. Uh, you, know, you can't hold yourself out as ethical people if you've got you know, members that aren't discouraged from doing unethical acts. Would you agree with that, Kleppers? Well, yeah, um, just so, so really quick. I, in general agreement, yeah, I'm, I think that the, the legal framework in Australia is too complicated and too grey in general. That's just my general comment on the matter. I've helped people with lockouts. I will never take money for it, and I'll only do it for friends and family. That's it. Um, because I'm, I could potentially still screw something up, and I don't know enough about the internal mortis mechanism, and I don't, I don't have the ability to just go down and get a new one and completely replace it within a short period, so I only touch stuff that I feel comfortable with. I don't generally don't like the idea of touching locks that are in operation for something. 
um, just because I like fucking with things as well. Um, <laughs> and just as a general extra comment from an ethical perspective, I think it just I share the the idea of having empathy with between the two sides that Joss and Grace have talked about. Um, but I also think that in, uh, a point that you might have been touching on earlier um, was that I think there's a need for honesty on, on both party sides too, right? So I don't want to see a YouTube video where someone claims to have picked something in a minute that's high security without, any, without, without a single mention that they've really had to practice for it because I think that's actually not very useful. I'd like, I want to have some information well, about... Well, it's actually more destructive than it is anything else. Yeah. It's, it yeah. doesn't bring anything to the conversation. Yeah. Same with, like, I want to see a gutting. If you take a high... If you claim to... If you want to have credit for taking a high-security lock apart, you know, it's single-take video, basically. I want to see that the sidebar pins are intact and that you haven't screwed with them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Voss? Well, um, where was I? Um, <laughs> the, the ethics of lock sports people starting a opening server, because that's what, what, what you were talking about. Does it happen that often that it's a problem here? Uh, not that I've heard of in Melbourne, but it doesn't necessarily mean. We've got more issues than lock sport people. Uh, we've got, you know, oh, hang on, is someone saying that they do it? No, 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 so I just want to say that, that when it did happen, it only takes one time for it to make a, a, a very large negative Yeah, okay, okay. But, but, but in, in Europe, there are uh, locks, uh, locksmith have way more problem with uh, totally unskilled people that happen to Yeah, we drill. have those too. Yeah, um, I'm not going to pick... cut you in the price. Oh, like. look, handymen are a big problem anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm actually saying there are people, the, the Google um, issues that we have with, not, with various Middle Eastern groups who come here with very little or no training... Um, setting up with a key machine that they can buy from Israel, um, they, they're an issue too. And, and is that bigger issue than Locksport? By far. Is it a big issue in this communication, in this discussion? Probably not so, but it does. It, it really does hurt us. And um, the one person... We're, locksmiths are a very, very close-knit bunch. We know everybody in it. There's... I know in my particular position where I teach, I know probably about 150 odd locksmiths in Melbourne alone, probably know about 300 across Australia, and we all know each other. And if someone, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Western Australia, we feel it here in Melbourne. We, we, we totally do. But surely the divide between locksmiths and, and the locksport community isn't just about lockout services. It, to me, it seems to be that there's is, is it stamping on the ground of locksmiths? Is it, is it that they're, they're not ethical or they don't have background checks? Is it that oh, they haven't I gone through an just apprenticeship locksmiths. system? Uh, yeah, look, there's locksmiths that haven't gone through the apprenticeship system, um, depending on how old they are. A lot of people learn it the old-fashioned way, where it was just handed down um, from word to mouth. Um, I, I think it's a cultural change. It, it's, it is happening. Do you see events like these as bringing those two sides together? I mean... Do you, do, you rec do you see many locksmiths that you recognise in the audience? Yes, I do. Well, I do see a number of locksmiths hiding around in there. Um, I think it is good. I think they'll look, I think it's very easy to sit in a chat room and just go, oh my God, these guys are fucking destroying the world. Fuck, 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 fuck. I hate them, I hate them, I hate them, and I hate this guy, and I hate that girl, and I hate that guy too. That's, that's really easy. Uh, any idiot can do that. But to come here, look... And see the fact that, they, you know, geez, we had, what, 21, 22 people impressioning. We had six guys on site. So we had some people in there doing RF hacking, which most locksmiths would just go, yeah, I want to be there. I want to do that. Um, that's great, in my opinion. So, so do, do all locksmiths know about the locksport community in general? We no, don't I actually understand why the frig you do it. Well, it's Once job, again, it? it's a commercial thing. We, we go, yep, yeah, done that, moving on to the next job. We don't want you guys to make our jobs harder. We don't want you to educate the public. <laughs> By the way, my views are purely my own and no way reflect the views of my employer, my subsidiary companies or anyone else. Um, and do uh, I do not give any express permission for this to be uh, to broadcast to anyone else. Do we have any questions from the audience? There's a... Uh... 
Ask me about apprenticeships. Ask me about training. Ask me about why you couldn't get the safe open up the back. Knowing most of you up there, right there. Um, knowing also how it, how hard it has been for locksport people to communicate with locksmiths themselves. How do you see it moving forward, bridging that gap, not just through events like this, but in everyday life as well? Persistence. Um, education and training where locksmiths through TAFEs or any other methods um, are reached out to by InfoSec people or white hat, black hat, whatever you want to be. Um, so that we can do some training and we can see what we, we help you with. Um, and try to make you better informed customers of locksmithing services or physical security services as I think the term locksmith I think is kind of conjuring up some guy sitting in his shed building locks. I think the real world view of it is is that we've become a lot broader in our understanding of security and how it all fits together. I will make a parallel and say that in the InfoSec hacker conferences there's a very strong percentage of, of professionals um, government and, and various privateers. I mean, it's you know, it seems to me that that the locksport community and, and the locksmithing community is, is is about 20 years behind the infosec world. Most definitely. If you come to a locksmithing conference, it's mostly the same bunch of people drinking the same amount of beer, if not more, um, talking about the same thing that they did three, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. So blah blah blah. Back in my day, blah blah blah. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. It sounds like you've been to a number of conferences. Um, These this, youngsters. This, oh yeah, they're coming and taking my money. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. I think that integration between the two with better training um, and maybe not giving InfoSec people a diploma or certificate, maybe just coming in for a five-day thing might be the way that we actually start bridging that gap. Voss, what do, you, what do you think about, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Like, how do you do it? Do, 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 you, do you invite locksmiths to conferences? Do you invite them to, to, to your conference? A, a couple of our members are locksmiths and, in the Netherlands. And uh, we do. I mean, uh, we have a couple of manufacturers who, who definitely come to our conferences. And we like those. And, and some, of manu some of these manufacturers hate us to death. And, well, not to death, but uh, some cuddle us to death. So I'm sure it's a love and hate uh, relationship. So it's, 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 it depends. Uh, yeah, it is. And, uh, so, yeah, and we had uh, a couple of members who were clearly sport pickers that started working for tiny companies like Hasse Abloy and uh, as consultants and some of them full time. So it, it, it is boundaries to be crossed and it's definitely doable. I mean, we are talking about different skill sets, about different view of the worlds, and uh, there's no one truth, and people can learn from each other, and please let's, and that's what they do. Honestly, I think if we had something like this at the uh, Master Locksmiths Conference down in Geelong later this year, where you could learn how to bypass an alarm system, and you could do some software-defined radio stuff, and a little bit of impressioning, or tamper evidence seals, I think you would have the place absolutely jammed, packed with with locksmiths because they want to learn new skills. I just don't think they know. And I know, um, I saw Crikey, B-Sides, Canberra, woo! Um, Topi's um, fantastic, God, God damn it, brain. Too many beers. Or too less. <laughs> It'll come to me. The Lock Villagers? Uh, yeah, the Locksport Villagers, um, the fantastic event that they ran here last year, Platypus mm -hmm. Con. I think if Locksmith saw that those events and they could see a commercial reality in the things that they're learning there, I, I think you'd find a lot more of them just quietly sneaking in and paying very quietly and just uh, learning a lot. I'll, I'll take a question in a second, but just to follow on with that, there are commercial companies that, that do come to these types of conferences, things like you know, lock, pick, lock picking companies like PigPals, for example, or you know, Lock Picking Australia. Like, how does how does the industry see these companies? I mean, you know, for, for you know, lock pickers, you know, love love them really. Because, you know, we have some Australian you know, companies now. But look, I think uh, Aaron's hit on the point. You've got the old guard and the new guard in locksmithing. Um, I know locksmiths that will refuse to buy from some locksmithing tool suppliers because they sell openly to non-locksmiths. Um, 
personally, you know, I'm a pragmatist and a consumer. I'll go where I can get the cheapest price and the best service. Um, but, yeah, that is widely varied within the industry. Yeah, let, let's just say that there are some locksmith supply companies that don't particularly like uh, people like pig pals, sparrows, et cetera, et cetera. It, look, it's a commercial reality for them. But by the same token, they'll sell key machine to um, super super cheap auto. Yeah. So yeah, but that goes both ways. I exactly, mean, I, it cuts both ways. I've spoken to to official suppliers, and in a non-recorded session, he said, "I don't care if they if they the customers steal cars with it, as long as they do it with my tools." So yeah, I mean, come on, ethics and so so, so yeah, it, it goes definitely both ways. We'll just take a question over here. So, total change of pace. In, in cryptography, um, we have uh, a principle used to sort of judge, you know, whether a, uh, an algorithm is good, uh, Kirchhoff's principle, which is like over 100 years old, uh, and it's basically saying that everything about a crypto system can be public with the exception of the key. Um, and if if that principle holds for a crypto system, then it's a good crypto system because you're not relying on any secrecy apart from the key itself. Do you feel that uh, that's a good uh, principle that can be applied to physical locks? Uh, and if not, why not? Well, a physical lock you can break open. So if you're going to tell me you can buy a lock but you can't open it, then you better make sure that I can't buy it because I, I can open that thing. And if it's a purely mechanical lock, I can visually assess that there's only one key that opens that. Uh, so that's, that's different in the crisp, crisp, uh, crypto system. <clears throat> so if there's a back door in your crypto system, yeah, I have to be able to read code in order to figure that out. Not a lot of people can do that. But if I can explain to somebody the basic inner workings of a lock, I can see if there's a back door or not. So, yeah, same principle applies, but the, by starting to sell a lock, you're basically uh, uh, opening yourself up to the, the same uh, research as, 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 as you're saying. So, yeah, of course, you can look at a lock and see how it works. So, the inner workings are open. Clippers, have you ever come across a lock which has advertised one thing, but actually... Uh you know, it has in turn, in fact, turned out to be quite the contrary. And Voss as well. Have you come across locks where they're advertising some security claim? Go to a market in Turkey and buy a lock. Done. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a there's an Australian supplier who was selling something that at a high price point and claimed to have security pins in it, and uh, they they did not have security pins. And then I just bought a whole bunch of different ones from different locksmiths across the country just to make sure that the batch wasn't affected, and they all were missing the security pin. So I would like to hear back from them, and they they seem to recently try to make contact, so I don't really name who they are, because I had one negative experience with one person in that company. I think, like, marketing side got my phone call originally, and basically told me to get fucked, and threatened to sue me if I were to publish any details about this. Um, everything was fine in the conversation, and then I basically went, so, like, they asked me, so don't you want a refund? I'm like, no, I just wanted to tell you that it doesn't have what you've advertised in it. And they're like, okay, so you don't want a refund? I'm like, no, I just literally wanted to tell you. And I'm like, and then they asked me, are you going to tell anyone else? And I said, maybe. And at that point, immediately, I was asked if I had a license. And when I said I didn't, they threatened to sue me. You did not have a license to buy. No, a, a license to, uh, as a locksmith or as a traded, accredited security well, professional in well, some way. Aaron, license? is there a disclosure policy on, you know, like if you've discovered a flaw in a lock, you know, certainly for InfoSec, this is, you know, 20, 20 years old, this, this process. What do you do if you've found a, a significant vulnerability that needs to be addressed that maybe is a false advertising, a manufacturer problem? Well, if, it's, if it's false advertising, then then that's different. Yes, okay. Because then, then... Consumer law. Yeah, that's, that, that's different. But if... if <clears throat> purely hypothetical... <clears throat> Hello. Um, if I find a vulnerability in a lock that I think is major, I probably will do the right thing and, and go through a responsible disclosure. So talk to the supplier. But of course, most locks today are not software. So updating them can be a hassle, to say yeah. the least. So it, it's, it's always a challenge to do that in a, in, in a normal way. And of course, suppliers starting with, we're gonna sue you, 
that's not the best way to start a conversation because that tends to well, rub the wrong way and then my co co cooperative mode is also switched off. So. I'd relate it back to a zero day uh, hack. Basically, if I could commercialize it and I could use it to my advantage for a little bit, I'd probably keep it under my hat for a little while and then I might tell the supplier if I feel like I really want to. But that's me wearing my bad hat. My good hat would be most definitely, if, if I think it's going to be a massive security flaw that it's going to impact a lot of people, of course, I'd pass it on. If I could use it commercially, uh, I might use it commercially to give myself an advantage for a little while. What about public disclosure? Like, what is the process? Do you, how do you know when to publicly disclose a you problem don't. in a security system? You don't know. You never know. When it's in the pu general public's interest that it's going to impact them in such a way that they must know. But for most manufacturers, I'm sure the process is, well, you know, well, disclosing it is going to affect the, the security of customers. So their, their premise is not to disclose it in general. Yeah, I but, think but normally in software you go like, okay, you have 30 days or 60 days to fix this, and then we go in public. And if you, if you ask a lock manufacturer, how long should I wait before I release this? They, they probably said a millennia or three. Uh, and that's, yeah. I mean, I mean that's, it's just different. So, so you have to find a middle ground. Yeah, but you can't just roll out patches for your locks. That's correct. So yeah. it's like way more expensive, you know. I know, and, and it also depends on in, in which, uh, uh, in which segment of, of, of cons consumers th this lock resides. Uh, I actually remember a few years ago now that um, there was a paper going to be released at an academic conference defeating a, um, an immobiliser on a, on a luxury car, um, a supercar in fact, and the, the manufacturer of that, that, um, that security system uh, uh, made a, a legal complaint and actually uh, uh, tried, to, uh, tried to stop them from presenting their work in, in an academic conference. Mm -hmm. And I think the outcome was that they could do the presentation at the conference but they couldn't publish their paper. I mean... Is this the right? Is this is this the, just the go-to thing that manufacturers do? How do you stop that? I mean, surely it doesn't help the the, the the security industry, the security of people, that that there's just zero disclosure on every big vulnerability in, in a physical and, system. And if we're talking about actual super supercar, those are also super super expensive. So yeah, image-wise, that's going to hurt them like hell. But uh, if it's um, we're talking a couple of cars with customers who, who paid a stupendous amount for them. I'm pretty sure you can service those and replace those locks. If it's a consumer-grade lock, then every household has those. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. So it depends. So, yeah, but that super, super car probably has super, super lawyers as well. So, yeah, saying, fuck them, it can cost you. So it, it is hard, yeah. Are there any questions in the audience? Well, it's almost, I mean, the, the, the natural, like, the silly thing to lead this onto is almost like the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, lots of physical devices, all have terrible security. I mean, I mean, is, is the physical world of, of locks, you know, like this, that they just produce something? Is a pin tumbler lock, is that, is that secure? Quite. Quite frankly, I think if you're using an inline pin tumbler for a security application in today's day and age, well, it's really at your own peril. There are better solutions out there, but uh, people have just bought into the marketing. I mean, you look at it, a consumer walks into Bunnings, which is, you know, quite frankly, the largest retailer of locks in Australia, and what are they presented with? Lots and lots of marketing hype from Lockwood and Gainsborough, the two biggest suppliers in Australia. They're really not aware of the choices or the other solutions out there, and I think in some ways, you know, this is where testing, uh, you know, those boundaries and, and trying to crack the old chestnut of, you know, security through obscurity helps the consumer in the end. Because um, I'll, I'll be blunt, you know, people talk, you know, people from the Locksport community talk about, uh, you know, having been oppressed by you know, the manufacturing companies. I think Aaron will agree with me that uh, when locksmiths identify, you know, problems with locks, even if it's just with regards to uh, serviceability or, uh, you know, general construction quality, they're quite often shot down as well. Um, you know, quite often the people fitting them and fixing them are the first ones to identify that there's an issue with a lock. You know, I think a perfect example was, you know, the mortise lock from Lockwood with a hole in the side of it. Uh, that's not quite the one I was thinking of, but... Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a five-shaped star bit that goes inside a lock and it breaks with repeated frequency and those whole locks, a whole ten years of research and development went down the tube with 5,000 locks being manufactured and installed at massive expense to the company. Well, what about home alarm systems? You go to Bunnings, buy the most expensive home alarm system, and you can do a replay attack with the software to find radio to disarm the system. Is, is, that, is, a, is a home alarm system from a hardware store worth its, worth its money? No. <laughs> well, depends on your risk profile, but normally the answer would be no. Well, I'd be more worried about the fact that they could probably just knock out a couple of bricks and walk through the side of my house. That's how Australian building standards are. Yeah. Um, alarms are as only as good as the other bits that go along with it. You know, do I want my security sandwich with just uh, one life of uh, dry bread, or do I want the full uh, the full Reuben? It, it really just depends. Australians are very, very, very non non security thinking. And the she'll be right, mate. Attitude permeates all levels of decision making and mm. the cost, benefit, security risk triangle um, is in full effect and Victorian, uh, sorry, Australian consumers are extremely price conscious. We'd much rather have a big screen TV to watch the footy, whatever code it is that you like, rather than actually protect the shit that's in our houses. Yeah, mm. don't take his TV. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not just an Australian thing. Uh, no. Well, look, the European model is that the stronghold model. I've got one door into my apartment, I put a half-decent lock on it, and um, I'll hope for the best. Depends where you live, but yeah, I see where yeah. you're going. Yeah. We'll take a question over here. I want to get your opinion on this. Should Bunnings be selling safes and locks and be part of the security industry or they should be stopped altogether because you can pick up and drop a bunning safe and it's open in seconds. What do you think? They're not safes. But they're marketed as safes. They've been marketed as fireproof, yet... Fireproof cash tin. Exactly. Sorry, paper tin. <laughs> and I think that a lot of that comes down to, uh, you know, our standards legislation in Australia and our consumer protection laws, you know, once again, this is, you know, Clippers touched on it. it our laws are grey and weak um, and they're usually not enforced and you've got massive, massive companies with massive, massive profits and lots of lawyers and unfortunately, you know, the, the government has to behave as the model litigant and uh, behave ethically. Um, you know, as a big box company, you can pretty much do whatever the hell you want. Market share. I can buy in 16 pallet loads of your... Freshly imported lock, or you can go and get staffed. And guess what you do? You sell it to Bunnings. That, that, that's unfortunately the cold, hard reality of the way the world works. Um, would it be great? I think it's going to have to be consumer-driven, the change in security perception. It's going to have to be led by locksport and locksmiths and security advisors to change that culture. And I think it's going to have to also take part of the insurance company. If there's anyone here from insurance companies, um, they'll change it. They, they did it with transponder technology in, uh, Western, sorry, in West Germany in their cars. Before that, they had great high security locks, kind of, that you could just drill out. You could drive the car over to East Germany, be parted out through bulk area, and before you know it, you'd be selling the parts in, in America. It will be led by insurance companies. If insurance companies see that their premiums aren't getting paid and that their payouts are too high, they'll change. That's it. I was talking to um, a woman earlier, Sally, who's a locksmith, and she, we were kind of talking about, you know, the choices that people make around what locks they find or that kind of thing. And she was pretty much like... Whatever helps you sleep at night, like, is kind of... Because <laughs> if somebody wants to get in, they're going to find a way to get in, right? They're going to find a way of bypassing it. Um, and if they're a really serious business, they'll probably use social engineering to do it, you know? <laughs> because that seems to be the easiest way to, like, Battery-powered reciprocating saw. Yeah. So, you know, we're kind of talking about, like, for some people, it's having a dog in your backyard. For, so, like, so it's different for different people, but... Uh, I think, um, you know, having, if, 
Uh, I think the the point about insurance is mm. a really good point because that will be probably the way that people are going to find out. They'll try and insure their things, and the insurance company is going to be like, "Well, what's your what are your locks like? Like, what what's your security like?" And that's probably going to be the thing that will get people thinking about it, probably in a very frustrated way. But like, <laughs> you know, that could be. There's probably, I think, a good way to get people thinking more about their home security and stuff. Yeah. Look, we've got about five minutes left, so we might just start to wrap up the panel. If I could ask each of our panellists for, for, for some final words, maybe a little bit about what we've talked about or, or, or something that you'd, you'd like to say. Uh, Kleppis, what, what, what would you say to the people here? Uh, first off, thank you for coming. Um, I, a whole bunch of us sat in a Slack channel and went, let's make this happen. And I think each of us in our own times has said or thought to themselves over the last six to eight months, like, this is not going to fucking happen and no one's going to bloody show up or it's just going to be shit. So thank you. Um, secondly, I think it just, I want to reiterate the sort of points that I, I, I personally feel, I think these are two, two things that we could all do on both sides of this sort of dichotomy, which is, yeah, be more honest and share some empathy to each other. Don't, don't carry an ego. Like, if you're a sports picker, don't carry your ego into a locksmith store and confront the locksmith. Mm -hmm. Like, I try to be nice. I haven't found that niceness always reciprocated. But when I do, it, you know, it tends to, you te it tends to come from both people just being friendly to begin with. Be honest. Um, vulnerability disclosure in, locks in, in physical security, I think, is a slightly different cup of tea to being able to, in theory, roll out a patch. Now, I know with I, some IoT systems, for example, you not, might not be able to do that. But I still think there's a, a point where, yeah, you might, it's not, it's not a black and white subject where you kind of blankly go, at this point, I do tell the public, or at this point, I don't. No, it's never and, black yeah. Um, uh, I think the, the only thing otherwise that I have to say is, uh, and perhaps a topic that you might carry across on or that, that we could always have conversations about later, which is that I think there's quite a different market. We have an isolation here in Australia. Mm -hmm. We've had a company that locally produced pretty cool locks um, that a lot of people overseas really like, Lockwood, for example. Um, and I think that there's a quite a large different market in different... So comparing things in terms of what the availability commercially, what's available to mm -hmm. consumers, it's quite different, say, between Australia and what you have available in Germany or the Netherlands or then even again in the United States. Yeah. And that's about it. Thank you for coming. Thank Pass you. On. Okay, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, I, I think uh, availability of locks is a regional thing. Because, uh, well, there is the internet, but then again, sometimes there isn't. Because if you live in the US and you, are, you want, let's say, a ProTech, you can fly in a ProTech, but then you cannot fly in the hardware to fit with your ProTech. And then if you ask uh, Asa Abloy, like, can you ship that? They said, no, we can't, because there's a American supplier. And there's one tiny American supplier that doesn't stock that stuff. So it, it's, it's, it is weird. So sometimes you can't buy the stuff you want to buy. And that kind of frustrates stuff. So yeah, and, and, and hobby pickers, well, I don't want all the hardware. I just want the lock so I can play with. So it's different source-wise. Uh, and, like, and, and we were discussing uh, uh, responsible disclosure. Uh, some companies started to learn that it's easier to, to be there earlier. So a couple of companies, and I will not name names, even after drinks, no, it's not gonna happen, um, that post R&D ship uh, some boxes of locks, of brand new, not on market locks, to sport pickers and just have a go at it. And we ripped them apart and, oh, are these, these are supposed to be unbumpable. And, oh, I didn't notice, sorry. And uh, so they don't get to market because we played with it. And of course that costs a shitload of money, but yeah, if we don't play with it and we start playing with it after market, that's gonna be a bundle of money more, so. Yeah, so, so we started to learn and, 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 and coexist in this shared space, basically. Which Thank I think you. is a good thing. Um, I'd like to leave with something that's kind of about general security and that it's quite a sensitive topic for people. Like, it's quite personal, like, what your state of, 
you know, how secure you might be feeling or uh, what your OPSEC is like or whatever. Um, I think, so you have to be careful when talking to people about things because you don't want to make assumptions because people might take it personally or they might not be able to learn from that because um, you kind of want to educate the people around you that you know, right? Because you know about this and you want your friends and family to be safe. So I think it's good to talk about security, but being really empathetic and not like, oh boy, you're a lock on your door. Is like, I could pick that in like two seconds. Uh, just let me show you. Cause you know, that person's not gonna be sleeping for the next month, you know? <laughs> like, so, uh, you know, be like, I guess my parting words would be, you know, be, be sensitive and have these like conversations um, and let, you know, let people have like a way out of those conversations rather than just backing to them into a corner about like how shitty their se security is, you know? So, baby steps. yeah, just, just baby steps and just being really nice is like the way to go, I think. Thanks, Chris. I, uh, look, I, I think that the way forward for, uh, you know, both security and the Locksport community is, is, is more stuff like this. Um, you know, I encourage, I, I see a broad range of people from, uh, you know, multiple sectors of the industry and, and, the, ho and the hobby here. And I, I just encourage everyone that's here to continue doing what you're doing and, and, and forge forward with, um, you know, doing it. Because with persistence, um, you know, we'll end up with a better product and, and a better you know, a better result all around for everyone. And, and just to harp on a point, um, you know, remember your security sandwich. It's not just about one thing. Um, don't get the tunnel vision and just look at one aspect as your perceived threat. Remember to keep it general and keep your eyes open because, uh, you know, the next vulnerability is only around the corner and a side step to the side. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the panel actually for their time today. And it's been great to actually have this kind of higher end conversation for once in a while it's it's a nice change it's a great to just actually talk about things at a slightly different level um, I think locksmiths will come around to this level of thinking eventually uh, it's just going to take time it's going to take patience remember we're kind of actually techno luddites you guys start talking about like RFID hacking we like the idea of it but you're going to have to be gentle with us okay mm. Um, I'll tell you how to break into a safe, no problems. But I'll be gentle with you and we'll, we'll, we'll take it easy. Um, I'd like to thank especially all of the staff here at uh, the Comedy Lounge for putting up with the shenanigans that's been going on here. Um, I would like to thank the locksmiths that have come along with a broad and open mind and not the big pissing ego contest. I'd like to thank Silvio and the team from... Uh, B-sides for their help and their assistance. I'd like to also thank all the people with orange lanyards. Mm. Um, without you guys, this wouldn't have been able to be possible. For the VIPs, thank you very, very much for believing in this and making this the event that it is so far. Um, it's going to be even bigger again next year. I heard that we're going to actually have a robotic dinosaur that we can hack. <laughs> <laughs> is that a I hope so. I've, I've said it now, it has to happen. I don't know where we're going to get it from. Um, you know, Beard Punish with his amazing um, key casting. If you didn't yeah. see that, that was fantastic. Awesome. You missed out. Next year, I really want to get over to the tamper evidence stuff. That looks fantastic as well. So please, when you are putting events together and you want to market it to locksmiths, make sure you really include all of the real physical security stuff. I know it's easy to write about all of the uh, great talks and presentations you're going to get on InfoSec and non-physical security stuff, but if you want lockies to start coming along, get a bit of a focus on that. Um, I'd also like to put out a big thank you to uh, Topaz. Where, I don't know, he's around somewhere. He's always... There he is. Hey. Um, <laughs> it, can I get you all please to put your hands together for Topi? Um, he's done an amazing job. Is that not got the guy from the side of Mortal Kombat? Smoke it! <laughs> it's just perfect for that. Um, yeah, really, I just would like to thank everyone for coming along, making this such a great event. Everyone that gave up so much time. I know, yeah, I did a tiny little bit, but it's been really, really good, and I would love to see a lot more people here next year. And, um, yeah. Let's Thanks. give one final round of applause to our panel.
Right now, pick up the chairs.